And welcome back into another edition of the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio Show. I'm Jeremy Bolker, along with our host, Dennis Tubergen. Four bestsellers, eight total books on consumer finance, and a keynote speaker on a number of financial topics. We welcome back in the Dennis uh, Tubergen, uh, the host for many, many years. And uh, Dennis, hey, w- welcome, uh, welcome in. And you know what? Last week, uh, for those uh, listening live or listening uh, on our podcast, uh, really not only across the the region and the state, but the country and the world too, uh, for the availability. You know, we did hit on a number of different uh, 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 factors and, and theories and uh, background of the economics, but we we did talk about stocks and talk about the the primary driver on uh, uh, stocks, and really we got to touch just a little bit on your forecast for stocks. But I'd like to get a little bit more depth there, a little bit more meat there on that. And so, uh, Dennis, if you could maybe recapture what you had forecasted for, for stocks and then, um, you know, some of the reasoning behind that. Yeah, sure. Jeremy. Well, it's always a pleasure to uh, chat with you and with the listeners. And, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we've got listeners all around the world. Uh, I think 70,000 unique listeners. So, uh, thank you all for your support and your interest in our work here. Uh, the stock forecast that I have, uh, don't shoot the messenger, but I am a bear. So, for our listeners that maybe uh, don't understand what that means, if you're bullish on a market, you're expecting it to go up. If you're bearish on a market, you are expecting a decline. So I Well, am- if you're a Chicago Bears fan, which I am, I know mostly you guys are Lions fans or some Packer fans, we know what it means to be a bear. Not good. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> well... Um, my sympathies for your sports allegiance there, Jeremy, but uh, there's always next year. So, uh, right, right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think when you look at, at stocks, there's a lot of things we'll talk about on today's program that have led me to make that forecast. And, you know, big picture, I think we could be looking at another 50 to 60 percent decline in stocks from this point on. That um, That is a pretty monumental. That's that's earthquake ish Dennis why so bad well there there's a lot of reasons and I guess I'll start with maybe a couple of technical reasons so when you look at how do you analyze where a market is how do you become a bull how do you become a bear there's two ways to analyze a market and when you look at stocks uh, you want to take a look at technical indicators and that really is looking at a price chart looking at trading volume, looking at averages of prices over time, uh, comparing uh, you know stock price movements today with price movements at other time in the past. That's a technical analysis approach. There's also a fundamental approach where you just simply take a look at the fundamentals of a business. Uh, where are corporate profits? Uh, are profits growing? Are, are profits shrinking? Uh, wh- where is a company's sales? Uh, uh, where's the stock valuation compared to profits? That's known as a price earnings ratio. So there's a couple different ways to analyze markets. And when I look at the current stock market, the broad market indices, like the S&P 500, like the Dow, both from a technical perspective and from a fundamental perspective, I conclude that there's a lot more downside risk than there is upside reward. And that turns me into a bear at this particular time. So, uh, Dennis, I know we're we're featuring stocks here, and uh, we want to stay tuned to the the, the program here because uh, you have a special uh, uh, British author, uh, Simon Popple, going to be coming up uh, talking about the, the the general status of the marketplace, but also talk about some precious metals, and those are obviously some different things to to keep in mind when you are building your retirement portfolio and what's going to be my best mix, what's going to be my best fit. But uh, talking about the stocks and how doom and gloom you are, uh, th- there's also some more technical data, which you explained, but there's something called the Elliott Wave Forecast, which you know, we just talked about it before the show. And I go, well, what exactly is that? If you could, this helps you with some of those evaluations. But maybe give us a little bit, what, what what is the Elliott Wave Forecast? So what is the forecast itself? But then what does that even mean? And how did that get to be? Why is this a, a good uh, factor here to consider? 
Well, Jeremy, I'll, I'll answer that question in a minute. Before um, I neglect to mention it, however, I'd like to uh, let everybody know that if you'd like to get the autumn forecast special report, today is the last day to get that. You can go to requestyourreport.com. Let us know where to mail the autumn forecast for uh, the economy and the investing markets, and we'll be glad to do that again. Today is the last day to do that. Requestyourreport.com. Now, to answer your question, Jeremy, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Ralph Elliott, I believe in the 1930s, that studied markets, and he concluded, and, and when you look at different markets at different points in history, you have to conclude that Elliott was, was right on. But what Elliott determined was that markets tend to move in five waves. And if a market's going to go down, then typically there's three waves down with two counter trend waves back up. So just for example, if you go back and take a look at the tech stock bubble that started to unwind around 2000, the market was down in calendar years 2000, 2001, and 2002. There was an initial wave down. The market then rallied. However, the rally does not get back to the same level that it was when wave one started. So that's wave two back up. Then you get wave three down, and wave threes tend to be very powerful. They tend to uh, drop a long ways when the market's headed down in percentage. They tend to be longest in duration. Then you get a counter trend wave four back up and then a wave five down. It moves exactly the opposite when the market's moving up. But you can still go back and analyze a market and see that there are five waves. Well, if you take a look at a weekly chart right now of the S&P 500, and if you want to go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com, you can get my September 25 newsletter, last week's newsletter for free. And I have mapped this out. So I'd encourage the listeners to go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. You'll see it. But from December of 2021 to October of 2022, we had a downtrend. That, I believe, is wave one down. Now, if you take a look from October 22 to July of 2023, the market rallied. That's counter trend two wave back up. And now we've got wave three down potentially. I mean, we, we don't know uh, until this plays out, but right now it's following script. So using this Elliott wave analysis to, to look at a market technically, I believe we may have to be at the beginning of wave three down. And seasonally speaking, Jeremy, as you know, um, in September and October, uh, we have some negative seasonal bias. Many market corrections come in the fall. So uh, that would make me very cautious here, just taking a look at Elliott Wave. But there are a lot of other reasons that I am bearish as well. So uh, just for those maybe who, you know, not necessarily as familiar with the Elliott Wave forecast and his history, one that pretty much most of our listeners, if not all, have heard of is Warren Buffett. So if you could maybe dial a little bit into this Buffett indicator valuation forecast. Well, obviously, when Warren Buffett says something, everybody listens. And in an interview um, many years ago, Warren Buffett stated that one of his favorite stock valuation indicators or one of his favorite stock valuation metrics, if you will, was taking a look at the total value of stocks. That's total market capitalization total market capitalization, and divide by economic output. So it's the total value of the stock market in dollars divided by the U.S. economy's production in dollars. Now, when you take a look at the Buffett indicator, and I've mentioned it here on the program in the past, um, the Buffett indicator now stands at about 160%. So right now, stocks are valued at about 1.6 times the economy. In December of 2021, when I believe this wave one I just talked about started down, it was about 2.2 or 220%. Now, to, to, to give some perspective to those numbers, because they're just numbers to many people listening to this, when the tech stock bubble started to unwind, we were at about the same valuation level as we are now, actually a little bit lower. So when I say I think we could see another 50 to 60% decline in stocks, that's not unprecedented from these valuation levels using this Buffett indicator. So uh, at, at historically speaking, uh, typically you have stocks that are less than 100% of the economy. We are now, you know, arguably more than double where we should be for a more normal or more average valuation. So for that reason also, 
Uh, I think that uh, not only are we seeing technically this this play out according to Elliott Wave analysis, but uh, the Buffett indicator tells us that stocks are overvalued here as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know if we even have enough time, Dennis, in this segment here before we get uh, uh, to Simon Popple in the next segment here. But, you know, about corporate profits telling us about stock valuations can you even hit on that a little bit, too, because those all sort of tie in together as well. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about that maybe more in segment four, but but let me just say that when you take a look at corporate profits as a percentage of the economy, they are way overvalued. They are about double where they have been historically, and I'll get into that in some more detail uh, in the next segment. But while we have a minute, let me just remind any listeners that may be joining us late uh, that I've got a free report available at requestyourreport.com. It is the autumn forecast for the economy and investing markets. When you go to requestyourreport.com and and ask for the report and let me know where to mail it, I'll not only send you the report, I'll also send you a copy of the revenue sourcing book, as well as the little black book on social security maximization. And that newsletter, again, if you want to see the Elliott Wave chart, that is at retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. We'll be back after these words. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tuberg, and I have the pleasure of chatting once again today with returning guest, Mr. Simon Popple. Simon is a longtime author. His most recent book, Introduction to Investing in Gold, um, is a must read for anybody that's thinking about investing in precious metals. And you can learn more about his work at goldprogram.co.uk. That's goldprogram.co.uk. And Simon, welcome back to the program. Great to be here. So, Simon, a lot going on in the world as it relates to fiat currencies. Uh, the most recent uh, BRIC summit here that was held now about a month ago as we're recording this saw six new countries admitted to the BRICS coalition. Uh, I guess it's not officially an anti-dollar coalition, but uh kind of looks that way. And a lot of oil producers now, I think almost half the world's oil production will now be part of the BRICS coalition. Um, how do you think that affects fiat currencies and the U.S. dollar in particular moving ahead, if at all? Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the U.S. dollar is by far the most dominant currency um, in the world. And um, obviously, you know, with these new new uh, countries um, joining the BRICS, uh, yeah, would it change things? I think it probably will, but I think it will be over a very long period of time, um, you know, several years rather than months. So um, it, it's not something that uh, I'm, I'm concerned about at the moment. So short term, uh, one of the things I've been looking at is the fact that the U.S. government has six, $7.6 trillion of debt that needs to be refinanced over the next 12 months and finance a $2 trillion deficit, do you think it's going to be possible to actually finance that deficit and refinance that debt without the Federal Reserve going back to the proverbial printing press? Uh, no, I don't think it, I, I, I think they'll go back to the printing press. I mean, I, I think the, the challenge they've got is um, uh, fighting inflation. And um, uh, I, I think I think it's going to be very tough between sort of printing more money and not having inflation going too high. I think that's that's the challenge they've got. Um, and, you know, to put it mildly, it's one hell of a challenge. So where do you see inflation moving ahead uh, worldwide? Do you see it accelerating from here? Uh, I put it this way, I, I, I haven't seen anything that, that indicates it's going to go down. And um, it, it, it's... Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. I mean, I, I think inflation, I think we're going to get used to uh, significantly higher inflation than we probably had over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but, you know, for, for uh, I'm sort of 55 and um, I certainly remember inflation in the sort of, uh, sort of 9, 10, 11%. And um, I'm not saying it's going to go that high, but I, I think it's going to be a lot higher than sort of the the two percent that we're used to. So um I think it's going to become a lot more relevant for people when when making uh, sort of any decision, um, but particularly investment decisions, because it's important to maintain purchasing power. And, and if you've got inflation running at 
let's say, I know, 7%. Um, if you invest in something to retain your purchasing power, you've got to get a return of at least 7%. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, you're losing purchasing power. And I think that's going to become very important to people. So, Simon, when when you look at the levels of debt that exist worldwide, both on sovereign balance sheets uh, here in the U.S., our debt just officially passed thirty three trillion dollars for the first time. Uh, but but looking at public sector debt and private sector debt, uh, Reuters just published an article that worldwide that debt is three hundred and five trillion dollars, and that's about triple where it was at the time of the financial crisis. Um, how do you uh, kind of reconcile that deflationary te- urge or tendency that will come from all that debt versus uh, currency creation by central banks, which is inflationary? It seems like there's a uh, currency creation leading to inflation and really high debt levels that will be deflationary. Uh, how do you think that ultimately reconciles itself? Well, I, th- I think, you know, you- you've hit this sort of the nail on the head. I think that that's the problem because... I think that, uh, you know, people want higher interest costs to reflect inflation or higher returns to, re- to, re- to reflect inflation. And, you know, debt's going up. That means higher interest costs, higher costs of debt. And, uh, it puts, it puts, uh, you know, sort of the powers that be in a very awkward position because you've got escalating debt, escalating cost of debt. And um, obviously, you know, you still got to uh, have services to to look after people. So Jerome Powell at the last meeting, last Fed meeting, stated that uh, or made statements, I should say, that were very hawkish looking ahead to 2024, where the the rate increases will continue. Um, At what point do you see the Fed going back to the quantitative easing or easy money policies? Do Do you think that Powell's, uh, you know, trying to have a good poker face here, or uh, do, do you see him actually doing the rate increases next year and, and maybe uh, easy money beyond that? How do you see it playing out? Um, well, I, I, that's a very good question. I mean, I, um, I, I think there is an element of poker face, but I mean, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, the dollar is a reserve currency. They, they control the reserve currency. And I think the important thing is, you know, if you're, if, if you're issuing dollars, providing uh, your, you know, if, if you're issuing debt, providing you're paying it back in the same currency, you know, you control both ends of the uh, of the argument. But um, I think that what is going to become more challenging is actually issuing debt if no one wants to buy it, so you end up putting it on your own balance sheet, and and then you've got an issue with um, the kind of value of your currency. And um, you know, I think so far they've, they've been absolutely fine, but I think, you know, there could become a tipping point at some point where people go, well, actually, you're issuing debt, but you've got no intention of paying it back. Um, and, um, therefore, you know, you're going to, there's a price to be paid for that. And, um, you know, I think, I think that that's the challenge. And, um, you, you know, you may say, oh, you know, we'll pay it back with, with money printing, but, um, uh, you can only print so much. So. Simon, when when you when you take a look at uh, economies around the world, and you know particularly the U.S. economy, um, I have uh, made the point that if it wasn't for U.S. government deficits, deficit spending to the tune of about two trillion dollars, that the U.S. would already be in a recession. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's all about the definition of a, a recession, isn't it? I mean, if you've got, I think it's um, you know, a number of quarters uh, in, in negative growth. Uh, but if you're printing money, you're gonna you're gonna keep them in positive growth. And um, you know, it's a trick you can you can play for a while. But as I say, you know, that's one of the reasons I like gold because you can't print it. And um, you know, I, I think there'll, there'll come a time when. Uh, you kind of run out of road. You can't kick the can any further. You can't print any more money. And, um, you know, therein lies the problem. So, Simon, uh, I- interestingly, you, you know, you say that, uh, you know, you, you can't print gold. And certainly that's a, a recurring theme I've heard here from many guests here on the program that 
you'll want to have assets in your portfolio that can't be printed. So let's just talk a little bit about your take on where traditional asset classes go from here. M many people that are saving in a retirement account uh, use the old Wall Street 60-40 portfolio, 60% 60 in stocks, 40% in bonds. Uh, wh where do you see people using that type of money management being in just a few years? Well, I mean, I, 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 I think it's um, uh, tangible assets are becoming more and more important simply because you can't print them. But I, I think you need to be slightly careful as well about, um, you know, uh, I think commodities as an asset class could do well, but I think some commodities will do a lot better than others. And um, so, you know, if we do have a recession, then by definition, people will be buying less stuff. And if they're buying less stuff, you know, if, if your commodity is made of that stuff, then, you know, you've got a problem. So um I think having a decent basket of different commodities um, is probably the way forward. And, you know, in that, I'd obviously include gold. Well, in the next segment, Simon, we're going to devote that segment exclusively to uh, what you would tell people that want to invest in gold. In fact, you've got a report that you're offering at goldprogram.co.uk. That's goldprogram.co.uk. Um but just talk for a minute about why you believe that gold or maybe gold and silver, if I'm not putting words in your mouth, are essential parts of someone's portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you're talking about assets that have been around for thousands of years. They've got form. And um, I think that, uh, you know, we'll talk about it in the next segment. But I think there's a lot of misconceptions about gold and, and, and to a lesser extent silver. Um, but I want to point out I'm not a gold bug. You know, I don't think you should have all your money in gold or all your money in silver, but um, I think you should have some and uh, very few people have got any. And, um, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting because people talk about gold in their everyday language. You know, they've been as good as gold or I'm looking forward to my golden years or I don't want them to marry that gold digger or I want the gold medal. There's a lot of, um, uh, I, I don't know, It's it, it's it's something we talk about a lot. Um, but uh, no one actually does anything. And, and I think that's one of the reasons they do, don't do anything is because they've got a misconception of it, which is, you know, why I wrote the report. Well, in the next segment, we'll be chatting with Simon Popel about his report, Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. If you'd like to have a copy, you can go to goldprogram.co.uk. That is goldprogram.co.uk. Uh, and you can get more information about Simon's work there as well. In the next segment, again, we'll talk to Simon about his report, Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. You won't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. I'm chatting today with the author of the book, Introduction to Investing in Gold, Mr. Simon Popple. Simon also has a just-published report that he's making available to listeners today, Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. If you'd like to get the report for free, you can go to goldprogram.co.uk. That's goldprogram.co.uk. And Simon, uh, give the listeners a little bit of background. What motivated you to put this report together? Again, Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. Well, I like gold because you can't print it and, and it's a global asset and, um, you know, it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, but, um, I think that a lot of people, uh, for, for whatever reason, you know, they look at it, perhaps they say, Oh, you know, I want something that, that provides income and doesn't provide income, which, which isn't strictly, well, if you buy physical gold, it's true, but there's other ways you can get income from, from gold investments. And, um, so the whole idea of the, of the of the report is really, for, you know, it's a free report that people can read it and um, sort of judge for themselves whether or not, you know, what they're doing is right for them. And um, uh, if they do decide to get involved, then, you know, I, 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 I try and sort of talk them through what I've done. And obviously, I've been involved in the market for a, a very long time. So, Simon, I'm sure you, you said something and I'm sure just piqued the interest of many listeners, and that is getting income from investing in gold. Because I think a lot of people think about gold as 
maybe a uh, treasure chest full of gold coins and and they can't possibly fathom how on earth that would generate income. So can, can you just provide maybe an example or two as to how you can get income from a gold investment as outlined in your report? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, what I like to do is invest in um, some of the large gold companies, um, you know, really large companies. A lot of them have got market values of over sort of 30 billion. Um, and uh, they, they pay a dividend. Now, the dividend is probably, I don't know, 3.8, 3.9%. But, um, you know, there's always the possibility of, of capital gain as well. And so, um, obviously, I don't put all my money in these kind of stocks, but I, I like I like the idea of having um, exposure to gold through a company. And so if the company performs well and the gold price does well, then, I, uh, you know, I can get a nice income uh, through the dividend. Uh, but, um, you know, there's also potential for capital gain. And um, depending on how much capital you want, I mean, what one thing that, you know, that I like to do is, uh, it, you know, the company's in profit, not only if you've got the dividend, but uh, if you sell a company in profit, you've got a capital gain. So, you know, you, you can do very well indeed. Simon, as I looked at your report, there was one thing that I thought was extremely interesting. You uh, you list gold performance since the turn of the century, since 2000, and you list that performance in various currencies, uh, Japanese yen, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, you know, British pounds, euros, U.S. dollars, and so on. Uh, and and what, what was really interesting to me was uh, there are some currencies uh, that have, I guess, compared to gold, devalued more quickly than others. But there is not a currency that has essentially outperformed gold. And, and I found that to be very interesting. Well, it, it's something I find fascinating, to be honest, because it, if you think about the way you live your life, you know, you, you, your house is um and your, your your earnings and your pension are all in the same currency you know in your case probably us dollars and um as you can see from from this table you know you, you can have gold in in any currency and if you look at the average along the bottom you know they've done pretty well and um so i i think it's you know what i there's a lot of things i like about it but one of the things i like about it is um it's relatively currency agnostic so uh if you if you hold gold um then if your currency does go uh south um you can uh you know your gold sort of holds its value and it may be that you you bought your gold in US dollars um and you can have a rather unusual situation where the if the gold price goes down but the US dollar goes down by more than the gold price um in US dollar terms you can actually make money so it's kind of it's, it's a bit weird, but um, you know that's the truth. And um, so I, I think people need to uh, look at gold as as a way of uh, sort of I don't know, potentially diversifying. You know, if if if, if, if they come to sell um, and the currency they're using has done very well, that's fantastic. But if if the currency has done poorly, then uh, you know they may decide that uh, they want to convert their their gold into a different currency. I'm chatting today with Mr. Simon Popple. He's the author of Introduction to Investing in Gold, and he has a report he's making available to listeners today, Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. You can get the report by visiting goldprogram.co.uk. That's goldprogram.co.uk. And and Simon, getting back to this this gold and different currencies, I, I find it interesting that the average across all the currencies that that you list here, and I think there are nine or ten here. Uh, that gold has returned about 9.3%. And, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, another way to look at that is that compared to gold, currencies, fiat currencies have devalued at an annual rate of 9.3%, which means that every eight years, the currency's buying power is halved. Is that a reasonable way to look at that? Well, I, I, I haven't done the math, so I, I, I couldn't talk to you maths, but I mean, it's certainly um, a way of, uh, you know, it, it looks like it's 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 helped you with your purchasing power, is all I would say. And so, if um, if you look at the average return, you know, providing the average return in the currency is less than, uh, sorry, is more than 
the the inflation rate, then um, you know you could argue that it's helped protect your purchasing power. So I think that in, in these days of sort of economic uncertainty and and inflation, uh, one of the things I really like about gold is um, uh, historically uh, it has helped you with uh, with some inflation protection. You know whether that's the same case going forward, we don't know. But um, uh, I think it's Mark Twain who said, you know, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but but it rhymes. So uh, I think if, if history does sort of rhyme, then um, you know, gold could be a could be a very good friend to have. So Simon, moving ahead, uh, is it your opinion then? Would gold be your favorite asset class? And uh, uh, if yes, uh, how would you say silver will perform relative to gold moving ahead? In your opinion. Well, silver has got a lot of industrial uses, and, and um, uh, obviously, if we do end up with with some sort of recession, um, then I think a, a, any any asset class that's got a lot of exposure to industrial um, will will suffer because of that. But I, I do like silver a lot. You know, I, I I wouldn't suggest anyone has a portfolio which is completely gold and completely silver, or completely a combination of both, but but I think it's important to have some exposure. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the, the current silver price is. I think it's around sort of $23. Uh, but if you look at the high, I think it's been close to sort of $50. So, um, yeah, having some in your portfolio, you know, I, 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 would, I wouldn't I uh, would suggest you don't. And, uh, you know, even though gold is close to um, all-time highs, uh, again, you know, I like to have some in my portfolio. So, Simon, speak to someone who says, you know what, I want to do, I do want to own physical gold. That makes sense. But I really don't want to take delivery of it. Uh, you talk about that in your report. Can you, can you speak to that for our listeners that may have that question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a big misconception that people have. They think, you know, I don't want to have gold bars lying around the house. And, and I totally get that. But, but what you find, if you, if you go through a reputable dealer, um, they'll store it for you or they'll insure it for you. And I find it a very good way of managing my money. So, I mean, yes, you've got exposure to the gold price, but you can see by that chart on page 13, you know, that that's done pretty well for you. And um, so I like to use these as a way of managing my, my money. So uh, use these dealers. So, um, you know, most of them, as I say, you buy it, you never see it, it never leaves their, their, their storage. And so when you want to sell it, um, you know, you can sell it. So, you know, the money goes straight into your bank account. And um, to me, it's another way of kind of managing cash. So you've got some in your bank account, uh, which uh, which is great, obviously. But um, I, I'm pretty terrible. If I've got money in my bank account, I tend to spend it. So um, I, for me, it's quite a good breaker to have some money uh, or, you know, in gold in, in, a, in another sort of form. And so if, if I spend all the money in my bank account, you know, I've got, I've got a liquid, um, asset that I can readily convert into, uh, into cash. Simon, we've got about a minute and a half left in this segment. And, uh, this is probably not enough time to have you answer this question in the way it should be answered. But I found it very fascinating, uh, the relationship between the U.S. debt, the U.S. debt limit, and gold prices. Can you briefly comment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you look at uh, the the chart that's in the report, I mean, one thing that's very interesting is the gold price seems to be going up with debt. And I can't see debt coming down. I, I haven't heard any argument from anyone that's convincing that, that, you know, the debt will come down. The debt ceiling seems to, to continually go up. So if the debt goes up and the debt ceiling goes up, um, there is some logic that the gold price, uh, you know, could go up as well. And, um, you know, again, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I find it a, a compelling asset to, to have got some involvement in. Well, my guest today has been Mr. Simon Popple. He uh, has a report available for the listeners today. That's available by visiting goldprogram.co.uk. The report is Three Misconceptions About Investing in Gold. Again, the website to request the free report, goldprogram.co.uk. Simon, always a pleasure to catch up with you and uh, look forward to having you back down the road. Thank you for joining us today. 
Great to be here. Thank you very much. We will return after these words. And welcome back into the final segment of the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio Show. I'm Jeremy Polker, along with the host, Dennis Tubergen. And you got to hear in the last couple of segments uh, from Simon Popple, a uh, British author here and uh, one of the experts on precious metals. And uh, Dennis, uh, let's let's sort of tie in stocks and our stock evaluations and what we got to talk about in the first uh, segment with precious metals. and. You know, while while everything is not always indicative of the other, are there trends sometimes? So if stocks are going down or precious metals going up, is there a time when precious metals are going down that stocks are going up? What do you see the correlation sometimes? And then tie that into today's economic forecast for where you're seeing, especially with the way stocks evaluations are going right now. All that being not good, folks, for just in case you didn't get to hear any of the show. This has been the last couple of weeks. It has not been good based on lots of different criteria. So where does that leave precious metals? And then historically, how has that ridden alongside or complete opposite of what stock prices do? Yeah, and and Jeremy, uh, you know, when you look at stock valuations, we talked about that in the first segment. Um, You know, the Buffett indicator says they're overvalued. Um, I think technically uh, there's a lot of evidence that there's more downside here in stocks. I should point out that my crystal ball doesn't work all the time either, but I believe that the evidence here is overwhelming that there's a lot more risk in stock than there is upside reward potential. So if you are approaching retirement and you're going to retire within the next five to maybe eight or 10 years, uh, it might make sense to think about looking at putting together a distribution plan and quit using accumulation vehicles, which stocks tend to be an accumulation vehicle. So that, that would just be a, a, a quick bit of uh, advice. And if you haven't yet done so, there's one more week left to get all the free information in the uh, special report that we have. It's the autumn forecast for the investing markets and the economy. You can go to requestyourreport.com and you can get that for free along with a lot of other information. So to answer your question, Jeremy, over any long time frame, longer time frame, I should say, stocks and gold tend to move inversely or in opposite directions. So typically when stocks are going up, gold is going down. And when stocks are going down, gold is going up. Now you can find short-term exceptions to that rule, but long-term, it's going to be very difficult to find an exception to that rule. Now getting back to corporate profits, right now when you take a look at corporate profits as a percentage of gross domestic product, Corporate profits are now about 12% of GDP. Historically speaking, the average has been about between 5 and 6%, about 5.5%. So remember when I talked about the fact that, you know, using the Buffett indicator, I believe we could see a 50 to 60% decline. The same is true if stock valuations go back to what is more reasonable based on corporate profits. So right now, Profits at 12% of GDP is hardly sustainable. We have to revert back, I believe, to to much lower stock prices. The same math applies here. Using that metric, we're looking at a 50 to 60% decline, uh, in my opinion. Well, that would factor in then, too, uh, with the Federal Reserve and some of the the, the easy money policies, uh, you know, with your stock valuations. Yeah, I mean... Look, we we have since I've contended here on the radio program for a very long time that since the financial crisis, we have been living in an artificial financial environment. You might call it hyper financialization. So here we have companies, corporations that could go out and borrow money, lots and lots of money. We'll just say vast sums of money at near zero interest rates. So they did. And what did they do with that money? Well, they used it to acquire other companies with positive cash flow, got the quality, got the staff, and scoop up the remaining cost reductions as profit. So easy money creates a lot of consequences, many of them unintended. Now, the other side of this hyper-financialization issue is that consumers could borrow a lot of money also at low rates 
to buy things that they probably would not have been able to afford, at least many of them would not have been able to afford them at more historically average interest rates. So just, just for example, take a look at what's happened in the housing market and in the automobile market. Now that you're paying 9% on an auto loan and you're paying 7% on a mortgage, I talked to a mortgage broker this past week that is now no longer a mortgage broker. They got out of the business because it's slow. So this is slowing things down. So this hyper-financialization created an artificial environment, and that artificial environment artificially drove up stock valuations, in my view. And now the proverbial rooster is going to come home to roost, and I believe we're going to see a correction. Well, and then, you know, again, I think we're just keeping, uh, it's like Rocky Balboa when he's in the corner, he keep getting hit and hit and hit. And that's what we're talking about is sort of the, the, the stocks right here. They're Rocky Balboa. You always want the rebound, but man, he's getting pummeled here. So let's keep, let's keep pummeling him here with, uh, then you throw the whole idea of debt accumulation. Uh, playing into stocks and uh, you know, re- you know, reaching these levels. So, I, I mean, go. What about that? What about how do you figure that that this debt accumulation comes into play here too? Well, you know, it's a really good point, Jeremy, because if you have um, an unlimited credit card, so let's just say that I gave you a credit card and said, Jeremy, here, here's a credit card with a fifty thousand dollar limit. Go have fun everything is going to seem like life is prosperous. You might take a vacation. uh, You might buy uh, some toys you wouldn't otherwise buy. And everything seems great until you hit the limit on the credit card. And then reality is going to have to set in. Well, that's kind of what happened here. So if you take a look at this corporate profit thing I was just talking about, corporate profits went from about $800 billion annually 20 years ago to $3.5 trillion annually today. So corporate profits are up 400%. At the same time, public and private debt went from $30 trillion to $95 trillion, and that's just in the United States. So there is a direct, not quite dollar for dollar, but certainly a direct correlation between corporate profits increasing and debt increasing. So when corporations have a 0% interest credit card with no limit, it looks like they're making a lot of money, but now we don't have zero cost debt anymore. And we're entering a period of time that I believe you could describe as a period of debt saturation. There's really no more room on the credit card to take on more debt. Households are at their limit. Arguably, government at $33 trillion is at their limit. Business might be at their limit. And I believe that's also going to play into stocks declining. So in the couple seconds that I have left, Jeremy, I just want to remind you. Yeah, your limit. (laughs) Yeah, requestyourreport.com is where you go to get the report. That's the autumn forecast along with the books. And you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com to sign up for the newsletter, to listen to my weekly headline roundup newscast. And I'd encourage you to do that. That's retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be back again next week.